Why can't you have sex with everyone in The Witcher 3? What can't you do in The Witcher? The franchise has been with us for almost eight years, and for most of that time, it's felt like you could basically do anything. In the first two installments, you could have sex with almost every major female non-player character, and this builds expectations. If it worked last time, you think, third time's a charm? And that brings us to The Witcher 3. In The Witcher 3, a side quest leads you to encounter and fence with a woman named Rosa Bar Arche. Your prior experience in Witcher games tells you that you should probably know where this is going, but Actually, it's going nowhere. One way or another, you part ways. Is it something you said? Something you did? Bad witcher breath? Rosa? She ran off. Anything happens to her, Varatra will kill me. Need to find her. Nope, that's just how the game goes. And Rosa just walking away has provoked a whole range of reactions across the internet. From, you mean I don't get to have sex with her? To, really disappointing. To, the ending of her side quest couldn't feel cheaper. To, there's plenty of good in-story reasons for this. So, what's going on here with all this back and forth? Why would a game lead you on like this? Why can't you have sex with everyone in The Witcher? Should you be able to? To start, The Witcher is actually addressing a common challenge in game design. How to satisfy players without being boring and repetitive. To solve this problem, The Witcher uses a narrative tool called side shadowing. Side shadowing is when you hint at something that doesn't actually happen within a given narrative universe. This totally goes against how we normally think about storytelling, though. Narratives are usually built to ensure significance. Unlike in real life, we expect events and stories to happen for a reason, containing logical cause and effect relationships between between disparate events. But constant significance gets boring really fast. If you're completely sure the chickens are going to come home to roost, what joy do you get out of it happening? That's where side shadowing comes in. Side shadowing doesn't say this won't happen, but it delays the prospect endlessly. It keeps you looking and wondering across the narrative, always keeping the possibility of an event happening in the back of your mind, fleshing out the potential of a narrative universe you're occupying. It leaves narrative threads deliciously untied. And that's what happens with Rosa. You you can't be immediately sure that the game is side shadowing, so you keep looking and looking and looking. That one moment, therefore, has a lasting effect, and this narrative strategy isn't unique to The Witcher. If you look for it, you can find it in plenty of other places. For example, in Mass Effect 2, a character named Zaid asks you to kill Vito Santiago. You make this serious life and death choice, but the game never lets you carry it out directly. Vito can still die, but not by your hands. The possibility of what you thought the game would let you do haunts you more than the actual resolution. As in The Witcher, this side shadowing replaces an instant payoff with a last impact. Other media also uses side shadowing's haunting quality. In The Sopranos' third season, a Russian mobster is left for dead in the woods and never seen again. Did that matter? Is he gone forever or just lurking at the margins? This question prompted all sorts of fan theories and debates just as Rose's side quest prompted discussion amongst fans of The Witcher. In frustration, The Sopranos creator David Chase asked, who gives a about this Russian. He views this sort of resolution as overrated and even cliched. And this gets at the biggest misconception with side shadowing, that the confusion it creates is a bad thing, as if good narratives can't leave lingering questions. In fact, this uncertainty is a very good thing. The range of reactions to Geralt's abortive encounter with Rosa is actually proof that side shadowing works. More specifically, this furor shows that side shadowing works particularly well in games. The narrative mechanics of video games actually make side shadowing more effective. With larger universes, games like The Witcher can make questions linger for longer, and the ability to go back and redo your decisions can be used to emphasize your ultimate powerlessness. I know, it seems really frustrating to not get that kind of payoff, that resolution, but trust me, we should be so lucky. So no, you can't have sex with everyone in The Witcher, I'm sorry, because that would dilute the game's narrative possibilities. The law of diminishing returns would set in, you'd get bored. Rosa and The Witcher are both more interesting and nuanced because this encounter is not consummated. But I get it. You may not like how The Witcher makes you feel cheated. Games normally give you a sense of total control, as we discussed in the Power Fantasy episode, yet here it's being taken away. However, Rose's rejection also adds a touch of balance to The Witcher. If you can't have sex with any of the male NPCs, why should you expect every woman to automatically say yes? It's beyond me, Geralt. I don't understand you. Narratives give us the illusion of being in control, but as the literary theorist Gary Saul Morrison puts it, in an open universe, the illusion is inevitably itself. The whole story of Rose of Arche is a reminder that narrative tricks still apply in the biggest of universes. That's the only way to keep things interesting. Lessons over. 
Remember what you've learned today. So what do you think? Does Side Chatter me explain this particular encounter with Rosa, or do you think that CD Projekt Red is just screwing with you. Are there other games that use side shadowing in a particularly interesting or profound way? Hash it out in the comments, and if you like what you saw, please subscribe. A big thank you to Josh Calixto, um, whose story that he wrote and we'll link to in the description was actually an inspiration for this episode. We'll see you next week. Last week, we talked about Rocket League and how it's this amazing blend of soccer and racing, but it's both of those things, but neither of those things simultaneously. And Monkey Pants Face made a very astute comment pointing us to an extra credits video that we'll link to in the description about depth versus complexity. So you can have things that are very deep and not very complex. You could also have things that are incredibly complex, but not very deep. Uh, and Monkey Pants Face points out that Rocket League is very, very firmly in the depth camp. So even though the complexity of the game is not nearly as complicated as a game like FIFA or nearly as complicated as a racing game like Gran Turismo. Out of that comes this incredible depth of gameplay. So that's an excellent, excellent comment. You all should absolutely check out the extra credits video and thank you for pointing that out. Nick Seibert and Dominic Snyder lament the loss of comments videos. And I totally understand they were, you know, a great opportunity for me to handpick comments and respond to them in a one-on-one -on -one sort of way. Um, unfortunately, as I mentioned before, you know, given uh, we looked at sort of the results of the survey and people, you know, didn't feel as fondly about comment videos as you did. But not to fear, not to fear. I'm gonna to respond to one or two comments at the end of every single episode. And of course, I'm going to be responding to comments, hashing out ideas in the actual comment section, deleting things that I don't agree with. I'm just kidding, I don't do that. But in any case, actually it's a great opportunity to make a little bit of an announcement. As you know, um, you know the show is on YouTube 24 seven, people leave comments 24 seven, but there's only one of me, and unfortunately I don't sit in front of the computer and answer all of your comments 24 hours a day. So Jason Johnson, one of our writers, and Kyle Cookstell, who's actually behind the camera right now, have uh, graciously volunteered to be part of the game show commenting community. One of the um, you know, unfortunate things about YouTube is that they don't allow me to designate certain people as moderators moderators to answer as game show moderators. So what they'll do is they'll leave a comment if they have a response to something and they'll just leave their initials after it. So to Dominic and Nick, I hope that this will do. We don't necessarily have any plans to bring back comment response videos, but uh, if we do, you'll be the first ones to know. All right, thanks so much.